So we're entering into the programming unit of the course, and not only do you get to learn how to program in Python, but we're also going to use it to explore concepts like algorithms, programming languages, data structures, and so forth. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about Python, the language, before we dive in uh, to the concepts. Um, one, so what is Python? And there's lots of places where you can learn about that. Wikipedia, for example, uh, talks about it being a general purpose language. It's very high level. And by high level, we're talking about levels of abstraction. So remember, early in the course, when we learned about machine instructions, when you write Python code, that translates, one line of Python code translates into many of these load, store, jump instructions uh, at the CPU level. Um, from a language design point of view, we'll look at different philosophies next week when we talk about programming languages. Python's deal was really to emphasize readability. Um, I think someone says that you read code about 85% of the time and you write code about 15% of the time in the software industry. So readability is crucial and, and there's a minimal syntax. Indenting is required for the language to be correct. Um, so there's a lot of interesting philosophies there. It also supports multiple programming paradigms, which again, we'll talk about next week. So you can program imperative, object-oriented, procedural, functional, uh, whatever mood that you're in, it's supported by the language. There's a bunch of other uh, features to learn, and you can go to python.org, uh, for example, if, if you want to learn more about you know, the up and the latest features of the language. Uh, but you know, the main thing is that it's batteries included. There's a whole bunch you can do with very little effort and very little learning uh, that are useful. And, and just to sort of look ahead to the end of the semester, the second performance task will be creating a program of your choice. And there's actually quite a bit that you'll be able to do with that with only several weeks of programming experience in this class. So start thinking about what kind of programs or apps you would like to build uh, for your final project. So who uses Python? One thing I want to emphasize is that Python is not a toy language. It is used by pretty much everyone, um, I mean everyone big. It's also the number one language for doing scientific research. So there's a lot of chemists, biologists, physicists, um, other researchers that use Python just because it's a great language for getting work done. Uh, you may not be shipping software necessarily. You might just be writing code to do some other kind of analysis. Um, so, you know, NASA, Stock Exchange, things like that. If you'd like to install Python, um, one thing to note is we'll be using version 2.7. Uh, the latest version of Python is version 3. If guys going back to Python's website, you know, you can go to the downloads link and it will ask you, do you want 3.4 or 2.7? Uh, the reason why we're using 2.7 is that's still the default version of Python on Mac and Linux. And until that community makes the jump to version 3, um, I guess I won't either in my class. Uh, I mean, they're pretty much the same in terms of what we're doing in this class. So if you have Linux or Mac, just run it from the terminal already. If you have a Windows computer, you can go to this link and download the installer for Python 2.7. And then you'll just be able to run idle directly from the start menu. So let me tell you in this video uh, what you need to know in terms of the Python language in this course. Uh, we've been talking about syntax and semantics this week and what that means with respect to primitives. Now, if you go back and look at section 5.2 of the book, there's really only four syntactical primitives that you need to know probably for the whole course, right? So one of them is assignment. And notice I'm using an arrow here instead of the equal sign because I want you to visually remember that what's on the right-hand side of the assignment is stored into the left-hand side. So when you see an equal sign in Python code, just think left arrow um, in terms of a mental model. There's also decisions. So we've learned how to write if statements in, in class and in the coding bat um, exercises. But when you read an if statement, there's this implicit then. There, there's no then word in Python, but that's what you should be thinking. If this, then that. And there's also an if then else structure. The else is optional um, in most programming languages. The third thing is loops. And the only type of loop you really need to know is the while loop. So while some condition do some activity, right? So do corresponds to then in the same way that while corresponds to if. Um, you know, and we'll look at how this uh, in the next slide, how this actually looks in Python. And, and finally, we have functions. Functions is when you give a bunch of code a name, and you can give that, uh, op that function as well some optional parameters or, or data that's required to run the function. Just like in algebra, you usually have f of x, and the way you say the parenthesis is the word of, right? So f of x, of course, in programming, we don't like to have single variable, uh, single letter variable names, so you might have an entire name and parameters. So here's an example in Python that you should be able to understand at this point after going through the Code Academy tutorials in, in yesterday's class um, that uses all four of these 
primitives discussed in 5.2. So what I'd like to actually do is show you this example in action. I'm going to run idle here um, in a separate window. And, and remember, you can always say file, new file, or file open to, to have code here. And notice what we have, um, first of all, is a definition statement. So I'm going to define a function called greeting. And this function requires a parameter hour, right? And I'm actually going to fast forward past the body of this function and show you what my program does. All that my program does is it runs the greeting function or procedure with the parameter value 9. And then it does the same thing with uh, 15. So let me go ahead and run this module so you can see what it does. Um, again, in idle to run, you go to the run menu, click run module, F5 is the shortcut key. And when I run that, I actually see the output here on the left in the terminal window, right? So you can see it says, good morning, it is now 9 o'clock, it's 10 o'clock, all the way up to 17, and then it says time to eat. And um, let me go ahead and add an extra print statement here so you can see uh, where the two different test cases run. So if you were to say run module after changing the code, you're actually going to get this little um, message that says you have to save the source code in order to run again. So I'm just going to hit, hit the Enter key. So it, uh, go ahead and click the OK for me. And notice how I've got now two blocks of output, right? Good morning, blah, 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 good afternoon, and so forth. So let's dive into the code and, and figure out why it's doing uh, this behavior. So you can see the very first statement of the greeting function is an if statement. If the hour is less than 12, print good morning. Otherwise, print good afternoon. And you can see the first time I ran greeting, I ran it with a 9. The second time, I ran it with a 15. And, th and that's why I have good morning the first time and good afternoon the second time. So now it says I'm going to count up to 5 PM, which is actually 17 o'clock um, in military time. I'm just using a simple integer value to represent the hour. So I have this um, variable now, which is going to be the hour. And as long as now is less than 18, I'm going to print it's now blank o'clock. Right? You can see how that variable now turns into 9, 10, 11, 12, and so forth in the program's output. Each time I'm incrementing by 1, and then at the end of the program it says time to eat. Now remember, um, this code is just defining um, this procedure. And I can still call this procedure in this other window. I can come down here to the cursor and say greeting, uh, let's say 20. right? And you'll see all that this code does is say good afternoon, time to eat. Now, of course, I probably should add something else that says good evening or I don't know. But it completely skipped the while loop because 20 right here is not less than 18. So anyway, it's kind of nice to be able to interactively you know, try out your code in one window while you're editing it in the other window. And, and, and you never have to sort of stop to uh, run your program again. It's just a way to play around with it and, and get familiar with it. So let me minimize idle. And again, as a reminder, you may want to rewind and, and rewatch sections of this video. I am going pretty quickly. Uh, but I, I also want you know, people to be able to consume this material at their own pace. Um, so one thing to note, again, from this whole example is that in Python, files are executed just from the top to the bottom. It, there's no sort of starting point. Like in Java, there's a main method. There's nothing like that in Python. It just starts running all the code from top to bottom. And the very first instruction of this file is to define a function. These other two lines, greeting 9, greeting 15, call that function. So define and call are the, is the terminology uh, for the two different sides of, of functions. So um, while I'm talking about you know, other students, I, I recognize that some of you are already taking a programming class or have had a programming class before. Um, it's not assumed that you've had any prior programming experience. And, and those students actually are probably at an advantage uh, because I don't have to sort of uh, change the way they think about things. But I would like to just briefly compare Python and Java, since that's uh, the, the number one language for uh, you know, CS intro courses that aren't like this one. <laughs> um, I guess that's all I need to say. So Python is a dynamically typed language. That means the type of variables happens on the fly. You don't have to, in advance, say, OK, um, you know, this variable right here now is going to be an integer. The language figures that out as it goes. And so the way to think about this is I'm taking a value in the program and associating a name with that value as opposed to declaring a variable. Um, the other main difference between Python and Java is that Python is very concise. So it takes very few words to express an idea. And by the way, these definitions are just from a dictionary, uh, WordNet. 
Uh, whereas Java is verbose. It's abounding in extra stuff you always have to type, which is kind of annoying. So here's one of my favorite examples. If in, in Python, if I just want to open a file, I say my file equals open and then the file name. Um, of course, this green line right here is a comment. In Java, oh, if you want to open a file, first you have to import the I library. Then you have to create a buffered reader. Well, first you have to declare the variable. Then you have to create a file reader object and wrap that in a buffered reader object. And I mean, you can just see on the right how much more code you have to type to do something simple like open a text file. So anyway, there's this nice blog, Python Conquers the Universe, and they have a whole series of posts there about you know, the differences between the two languages. Um, a few tips I might give you if, you, um, if this is not your first programming language and there's some things you need to unlearn. So uh, you know, I'll just compare these two examples here on the left and on the right. The first thing is forget about declaring variables. You should never have to do that. So you don't need a line like int x. You just simply start using x. Um, and you'll notice too in this earlier example, our right here, the parameter, I didn't have to declare that either. I just put our in the parentheses and the language will figure out what type it is when it needs to. Forget about semicolons. So it's actually okay if you want to write a semicolon at the end of every line like in Java, Python will just ignore it. But if someone else looks at your Python code with semicolons, they're going to know that you're sort of um, a Java programmer. Um, but do remember colons, okay? So in Python, you always need a colon before you change the indentation level. So for example, when I define a greeting, notice there's a colon here at the end of the line. That means that the following lines are about to be indented. And you can see the same thing with else, if, while. You always have a colon there because the indentation level is about to change. What else did I need you to remember? Forget about parentheses, right? So an if statement, for example, doesn't need parentheses like it does in Java. Uh, forget about braces. So indentation automatically captures the idea of blocks, right? So all of this code is under the if statement, this block of code print, because it's indented. Um, if you forget to indent, your code will not work, right? It's absolutely a forced requirement of the language that you indent it correctly, which is actually a very good teaching tool uh, because students, if they're not forced to do something, won't do it. <laughs> so that's why a lot of schools are switching from Java to Python uh, for their intro courses, including JMU. So there's this, also this nifty little comic that you should go read at some point. Uh, if, if you're not already subscribed to XKCD, you, you should. It's, it's, it's an awesome comic, but that's the... Um, obligatory Python comic that everyone should read. All right, so what's the point of all this? Um, I talked about how we're not only learning Python in terms of programming, but we also want to explore concepts like algorithms and programming languages and data structures. And I would say that the biggest concept for this week is going back to that big idea I introduced at the beginning of the semester, that computer science is a creative activity. Um, this is a great quote by Jeanette Wing. Um, she's the um, department head over at CMU, and she wrote this great article uh, in 2006 called Computational Thinking. And I would actually encourage you, this is not required for the course or anything, it's just a nice three-page article that summarizes what uh, computer science is, and it has a call at the end of the article that professors ought to create classes about ways to think like a computer scientist. Well, voila, here we are eight years later, and, and you guys are taking this kind of a course, right? So anyway, go back and read that article sometime. It, it has some great... Um, insights about how computer science or computational thinking, as she calls it, um, is a way to solve problems. It's a way that humans think, not the way that computers think. And, and anyway, I'll, I'll just let you read that on your own time. But going back into creativity, um, that's what section 5.3 is all about. So please, please read this section of the book. Um, it's a great read about how to solve problems, right? How to, you don't just follow a set of steps like the way math is taught in junior high and high school. It's, it's more about taking the initiative and really understand what's going on. Um, let your subconscious work for you. You know, you're gonna be solving problems not only in this class, but other computer science courses that you've never seen before. And, and you can never say, hey, the teacher never showed me how to solve this problem, because that's exactly what the industry is like. You're, con you're constantly being given problems to solve with the technology that nobody's done before, and you have to just figure out how to do that. So one of the techniques is, is trying to get your foot in the door, right? Getting started on a new problem is often the hardest part. Uh, you might have to reverse engineer things, uh, but please resist the temptation to look for a formula or to memorize some kind of solution. It's more about just getting insight. Um, and the more problems that you learn how to solve using computation, the more creative that you become. So I would say the creativity in computer science is not so much about making art um, you know, like in a graphics program like Photoshop. 
it's more about solving algorithmic puzzles uh, because you have experience doing lots of those challenges before. And, and that's the type of creativity that I'd like you to learn not only in this class, but the whole computer science major. Uh, one more thing about the book before we close. In section 5.4, there's a lot of stuff in there. And it's actually more than we're going to be able to cover this week in class. So I just want you to focus on the section about loop control. So don't worry about um, sequential search. Don't worry about insertion sort. Those are great algorithms. And, and we will take a look at those in CS240 and maybe a little bit in the data structures chapter a couple weeks from now. But for this week, just focus on loop control. It's just these four pages. Uh, in particular, section five, uh, sorry, figure 5.7 talks about how every loop in any programming language, this is an algorithm structure, it always has three components, right? So let me just show you this while loop um, from the book, this greetings example, right? Count equals three, while count is greater than zero, print hello, and then count equals count minus one. Here's the three parts of the loop that's discussed in figure 5.7. We got the initialization step, we've got the test, uh, where we're testing the loop variable to see if we've reached the termination point, and finally, the modify step, where you're modifying the variable that you're looping on. Um, you can actually find these three elements in any type of loop. So there's another loop in Python called the for loop, um, or some people call it the for each loop, right? So for i in range 3, basically is doing the same code in this while loop, but in fewer lines. And the reason why is the for loop is designed to do all three loop components in one line of code, right? So the for i in range 3 is doing initialize, test, and modify all in one concise little package. And now the only thing I have to have inside the loop is what the loop does. In this case, the loop is just printing the word hello. One thing you'll note as you read the book is Python does not have a post-test loop. There's no sort of do while or repeat until structure in the Python language. And that kind of goes back to the language philosophy that there should be fewer ways of doing something so you don't always have to figure out which way you have to do it. Um, it's easier to read code if there's fewer options. And so pretty much in Python, you have a while loop and you have a for loop, and th those are your two choices for iteration. So that's it for now. Um, if you need to review, again, please rewind, watch parts of this video, take a look at these slides on the website. Um, feel free to continue to go through Codecademy in the Python track. You're welcome to go and do additional modules. Uh, you only have to do the first one required for this class. And you might also want to get started on the lab for tomorrow. Let me go ahead and pull up the website for that. So going to the schedule page, click on Python and Idle. Um, there's going to be two main parts to the lab. One is just making sure you're familiar with Idle, which is this program for running Python code. And the other one is to write a little program that sings the bottles of pop song. I, I'll give you a little warning. If you watch this YouTube video, uh, be careful because you might get the song stuck in your head for the rest of the day. We're also going to uh, do some coding bat problems in the lab, so you might want to take a look at that beforehand. And please come to the lab ready to ask questions. Uh, that's just the best use of time. And then you can all finish the lab before you leave for the weekend and not have to come back on Saturday or Sunday. So with that, I'll sign out and see you later.